And we're back. Welcome back and happy Thursday. Today we'll be driving down more deeply, examining the first of uh, the five layers in our top down approach. We'll be looking at the application layer. But before we do so, some administrative bits. Homework number, that should be homework number one, write in a one, just to be absolutely complete. There's a little bit of a typo. Homework number one is out. It is due Thursday, 4th of February at the usual 11.59 or 59 seconds p.m. That's one second before midnight. Please make sure you're looking at it right away. All right. Why don't we begin? So we're going to look at principles of network applications as we kick this off. And our goals are conceptual and we're going to look at the implementation aspects of so-called network application protocols. Now, these network application protocols are the glue or the stuff, if you will, that gets network applications to work. We'll look at considerations that are important for designing, developing, implementing, and deploying successful network applications. We will look at transport layer service models, which are necessary to write good applications. We'll examine the client-server paradigm, how you think about the software components scattered about the network that collectively implement network applications. We'll look at the peer-to-peer -peer paradigm. We'll look at content distribution networks that give you things like your Netflix movies or your Amazon movies, etc. We'll also learn about protocols by looking at popular application protocols, things like HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Pro Protocol, which is what enables uh, the web to work. And there are lots of applications that so-called piggyback on top of HTTP. We'll look at FTP, File Transfer Protocol, which is eh, not so popular uh, now. It's SCP, Secure Copy, but nonetheless we'll, nonetheless, we'll examine FTP. We'll also look at email, SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which is responsible for transferring email messages from one server on the Internet to another. We'll look at POP3, Post Office Protocol, and IMAP, Internet Message Application Protocol. We'll also examine DNS, the naming system, domain name system, how you translate website names, so-called domain names, into IP addresses. And we'll talk about that in detail. We'll also look at programmatic examples in Python uh, for the construct uh, sockets, which is the API, uh, for creating network applications, for sending and receiving data. All right. So some network applications, uh, you all use lots of them, and these are just a very small smattering of them. Uh, but they can range from email, web stuff, text messaging, uh, multi-user gaming is quite popular, streaming media like YouTube, Hulu, both on the movie side as well as uh, the content creator side. Uh, Real-time video conferencing like we're doing with WebEx for class, social networking, all sorts of applications of a network. So how do you create a network application? Well, of course, as I said, a network application consists of a set of processes running on various end systems or hosts throughout the internet, and they exchange messages with one another to implement some application. And so some of the key ingredients, they run on different end systems, so different hosts, and they communicate over the network. Now, web server software communicates with a browser, and together, your browser and web server implement all sorts of applications. Now, of course, the beauty of this, all this complexity in the applications are kept on the end system on the host and not in the network core, namely in the service provider's infrastructure. So there's no need to write software for network core devices. The network core devices are deliberately kept very simple. They don't run user applications. Now, because applications only run on end systems or hosts, this facilitates very rapid development of applications. And so at the host, the design of the network keeps complexity at the so-called network edge. And so again, as we refer to the different components, the network edge refers to those at the edge or the boundary, as it were, of the internet. Now, 
on each one of these edge devices, our end systems or hosts, we have the full five layers in our layered abstraction for the various components that comprise the modern internet stack. We have the application layer, transport layer, network layer, link layer, and physical layer, as we had discussed before. Now, of course, all the applications running at the application layers, they speak or exchange messages with the other components scattered around, around the network on other hosts or machines at the network edge. And so together, all these applications exchange messages with one another, and certainly the applications don't directly send one another messages. Uh, all of the ability to exchange message data between these application instances running on the end system scattered around the network is facilitated by all the other machinery made possible by the other four layers, transport layer down through physical layer. But the beauty of the modern internet stack is that you only write applications existing on the end systems, and you don't have to concern yourself with what's happening here in the service providers in the network core. And so there are two major flavors of how you can structure your computations scattered around the network. One is called client server, and the other is called peer-to-peer. -peer. So why don't we explore those two? And so for client server, it consists of two processes, or more correctly, two processes that serve different roles. One in the ro is, takes on the role of a server, and the other takes on the role of a client. Now, the server has some characteristics that are different from the client, and this is a hard definition. Um, please make sure you know the distinction between the two. So the server is always sitting there running in the server process, listening for incoming requests. And the server typically has a permanent address, so you can always locate it. The address doesn't change, it stays put. And servers, in order to scale, often they collect these server processes together on a lot of instances of machines running in a data center. And they do that for scaling, because for certain applications, you can imagine Microsoft Xbox network if you're going to have a lot of users interacting in a game, you want to make sure that you have a lot of computation available in order to host all of these server processes. Conversely, the client role is a process in our computation uh, for a network application that communicates with the server. So the client doesn't always have to be on. It doesn't always have to be connected. It can be intermittently or so-called occasionally con connected, as is sometimes said in the literature. So the client is occasionally connected to the network, and therefore it doesn't always have to have a fixed address. It can have a dynamic IP address. And the reason for that is you can connect your client to one machine, pick it up, go someplace else in the network, and then open it up, connect it to the network from a different access network. Now, of course, if you're going to do that, it's going to assume a different address. And moreover, even on the same access network, you might change your address. So that's kind of like you're on campus with your laptop walking around. You go to the campus center. You get a certain address associated with the campus center. And then you move it into the department, uh, computer science building. Uh, you have a different IP address, and it all just seems to work. So this client, its role is to communicate with the server. And moreover, the client is the process between the client and the server that initiates a request. The server listens and satisfies incoming requests and the client is one that initiates this conversation. And so clients, multiple clients, like say your instant messaging uh, interface on your cell phone, they don't talk to one another directly. They communicate indirectly through some instant messaging server. And so the client initiates the request, says, hey, can you do this? Uh, the server stays on, has a permanent IP address, stays put, stays fixed. It listens for incoming requests, accepts those requests, performs some work, and returns back a result. And so this is what a client, a server, looks like physically. And this is a CPU, a computer, and it comes in a form factor that's so-called rack-mounted. And this thing, if you were to see it in real life, it looks like a pizza box. It's that size and form factor. And the height of these rack-mounted form factors are typically 1.75 inches 
also called one unit or one U. And that one U is a standard size measurement to reflect the height of each compute device. Now, these rack-mounted server form factors for computers, and it's an actual computer, uh, these are the hard drives up front. You see uh, some cooling fans here. You see some uh, memory sticks here. You see uh, the CPU with the heat sink right here. So it has all the usual things that a typical uh, CPU would have system, only this doesn't sit on your desktop. This is going to be mounted in a so-called rack. Now, here on the right, you see what's called a rack enclosure, or sometimes it's called in literature a cabinet. Now, this cabinet kind of looks like an armoire, but it's made out of metal usually. And some of them have wheels, some of them don't have wheels. And you can see that this door here closes, and inside of this rack enclosure or cabinet, you can mount these units, and they kind of screw in uh, from a faceplate on these tabs that are on either side, left and right, for the rack-mounted form factor. Now, along the cabinet enclosure, you're going to see some markings, and these markings represent one U height worth of compute device. And it's typical, a full so-called rack-mounted enclosure is going to consist of a total of 42 of these U units. And so this is called a full height rack, and it's typically a 42U rack. So that means this particular full-size rack enclosure can accept 42 of these 1U, one unit, height devices. And so that means literally you can fit 42 of these CPU units inside of this rack mounted enclosure. Now, of course, these things fit on a rail. The rail mounts on the side, and then you can anchor it at the front with a screw to set it down. But when you unscrew it, the rail acts like a drawer and you can literally pull this thing out of the rack, push it back into the rack on some sliders on these rail side mounts, just like you could open up a drawer on a desk and close a drawer on a desk. And that's on purpose is to make it a lot easier to maintain and pull and examine and change, upgrade, and tend to all of these uh, server instances. Now, this is the server hardware. Okay. So you take one of these 42 units, and of course, in a modern data center, you're going to have several of them, and it's not atypical to have 10,000-plus uh, server units uh, mounted in 42 U, U racks. These racks are collected together in a data center uh, as the stacks uh, or shelving like you'd see in a library, and they have aisles upon aisles of these 42U racks. Now, the data center is specifically built to accept these things, and if you think about it, if you have 42 of these units here, one of these might be anywhere uh, from 1,100 watts to as much as 3,000 watts of power that they consume. And so there's going to be a lot of heat these things are going to throw off. And typically in the design, there you have a bank of fans. You can see the fan units here. And they're going to suck in air through the front and vent uh, to cool off all the components because it can get hot. And it's going to vent them out the back. And so when you collect these things, you see here in this figure, the schematic, uh, cool air comes through the front and all the warm air is expelled out the back. Now, these data center facilities are designed specifically to heat to, and draw heat away and to cool uh, these uh, rack-mounted units. And so typically, um, you'll see them on these floors, and these floors are so-called raised floors, and they're actually raised off the ground. And you have a set of floor tiles that you can place uh, where you can walk along this raised floor and then there are other floor tiles you can remove them and put uh, grates in them. And so with this, you have precise control over where the cold air will flow. Cold air is pumped underneath the raised floor. And then where you have these great tiles here, uh, cold air will come up out of there. And so if you notice here, air, cold air flows through the front here. They're sucked in to the one new units in the racks. Uh, and cool, cold, warm air is expelled out the back. And of course, this warm air 
because warm air rises, rises up where it's taken in through some ducts, going into the HVAC system, and where it's cooled off and pumped back into the room. And so in this picture, you see the warm air wafts up. It's sucked in through uh, the HVAC system, and then it's pumped back out uh, through the raised floor, and the cycle continues. So you can imagine then that there's a significant amount of power. If each of the 42 units takes up, say, 1,000 watts, that's 42,000 watts of power, which is a huge amount of energy. And so it takes a lot of energy to cool a and run a data center facility. And so this is a artist rendering, architectural drawing, of one of Facebook's uh, data centers. I believe this is in eastern Washington amidst the potato fields. And when they locate these data centers, they're very specific about where they put them. They typically put them in one, in a place where, or location where there's a lot of space, uh, but also where power is very stable. So oftentimes when you see data centers, they might be not too far from power generation plant or high voltage uh, electrical wires or subsystems and so forth, or substations and so forth. And so these facilities are absolutely huge, hundreds of thousands of square feet, uh, typically occupying areas uh, that are several, several acres uh, large. And so this is what the inside of a modern data center looks like, and they're very, very clean. You can't have dust mucking up your systems. And then with the lights off, typically uh, there are lots of status lights for various things like data access, access to the network, and so forth, and you'll have technicians walking the aisles looking to see if something is a little bit awry. And so if you've ever had a chance to visit a data center, if you have the opportunity to go, I highly recommend you go. It's a fascinating thing to see. Everything's very orchestrated and done very deliberately. And so this is our peer-to-peer -peer architecture. Peer-to-peer -peer is a kind of hybrid between a client and a server. Now, peer-to-peer -peer architecture a prime example is something called BitTorrent, and BitTorrent is a high-performance file transfer system. And with peer-to-peer -peer systems, the name of the game and the reason why they're very popular is because of a property associated with peer-to-peer -peer architectures called self-scalability. Now, with a peer-to-peer -peer system, there's no always-on server. And so you have a set of processes that are interacting with one another, but there's no requirement that any one of them always be on and therefore don't have a fixed address, fixed IP address. And with peer-to-peer -peer architecture, any two end systems, or more correctly, the process on any two end systems scattered around the network can directly communicate with one another. And so what peers do, they request service from other peers, and those other peers provide services, and in return, the requesting peer also makes services available to the network. And so the self-scalability means that as you have more peer instances, they might use services from other peers or make requests of other peers in the network, but they also bring services to the network. And so the self-scalability says as more and more peers running on end hosts, these uh, end systems, these processes, as more and more processes join the peer-to-peer -peer network, so too do you have an increased number of resources from which to choose. And so while the demand is increased, the capacity is also increased as well. And so peers are intermittently connected and they can change IP addresses and therefore you need a directory, a way of complex, man complex management uh, of each of these potentially changing IP address. So when a peer wakes up, it says, okay, this is my IP address. It registers that with a directory or an address book of sorts so that new joiners can locate uh, the other instances of peers by their addresses. And so processes communicate with one another, and a process uh, is some program running on a host. It's the executable format of a program. So it's a program in execution. Now, within the same host, or to different hosts, processes communicate by something called IPC, or inter-process communication. And these are mechanisms made available by the operating system for the processes to be able to exchange units of information, packets or messages or others. 
And so processes on different hosts exchange messages, and they do so uh, through various IPC mechanisms, one of which, at least for the Internet, is, uh, as Internet is concerned, is the so-called socket API. And so you have your clients and your servers. You have a client process running on an end system or host, uh, and these clients initiate communications. And you have the server process. Uh, it's the one that waits for an incoming communication, and it responds to it with some answer or result. And so applications that are implemented as peer-to-peer -peer architectures have processes that serve both the client and the server role. And so here we have a client, and here we have a server. That client initiates a message, and that's something called a request. The server gets that request. It chops it up or parses it, so it parses request. It makes sense of request, so it interprets the request. And then it performs some action based on what that request is, and then it returns back the response. And that response, it server returns back to the client. And so there are messages exchanged, the request from the client, the response from the server, but in between the request and the response from the server's perspective, it processes the request, it interprets what that request is, performs some action, and then the result of the action is sent back as a response from the server back to the client. And so when we have a peer-to-peer -peer system, the scenario looks like the following. So let's say we have something called peer 1, P1, and we have peer 2, P2. And peer 1, when it serves the role of a client, it can initiate requests. Peer 2, when it serves the role of a server, it can satisfy requests. So here we have a client sending a request to a server, and then the server sending a response back to the client. Now, that's if Peer 1 wants to make use of the services of Peer 2. And let's assume Peer 2 had some file, some file, file number 1, that Peer 1 wanted access to. But Peer 1 also can have resources that others on the network might want. So let's say Peer 1 has a copy of file number 2 on the network. So in that case, Peer 1 is acting like a server when it makes its resources available, and Peer 2 acts like a client. And so Peer 2 can request perhaps file 2 from Peer 1, and then Peer 1 gets that request, it interprets it, it processes it, it performs the action of grabbing file 2, and then it returns it back as a response to Peer 2. Now, whenever you're interacting processes, in a network application serve both the client role and the server role, these things are called peers. And that's the formal definition of a peer. Right? This is beyond what's in the book, uh, but it's something I feel is really important for you uh, to understand. A peer is nothing more than a process that implements both the client and the server role. So peer two is acting like a server when it satisfies the request for peer one, and likewise, Peer 1 is acting like a server when it satisfies the request of Peer 2. So let's take a look at the API. It's called a socket. Now, a socket is nothing more than a set of application program interfaces, and most major languages have sockets. Uh, Java has sockets, Python has sockets, C and C++ have sockets, and all the others. And the socket is that abstraction uh, that the application sees, and it allows it to either send messages to that process on the other end of the internet communication or receive responses back from that process on the other end of the internet. And so in the book, they have a great analogy and they say a socket or discuss it as being a special type of door. When you send a, process, a packet into a socket, you, you shove it out the door and you can imagine those two doors are connected together along a hallway. And so this thing is kind of magical. It's not magic, really. It's just some engineering. We'll talk about all the underlying mechanisms. But when you put a packet into the socket on the sender side, well, it gets pushed to the other socket, and it is delivered to the process on the receiver side. And so the sending process shoves the message out this door. And you can imagine almost like these two things are doorways, 
and imagine there's this really long, slender hallway that connects the two, and the moment you push a packet into this doorway on one side, it gets sucked in and, and transported all the way to the other side, and it comes out the doorway on the other side. And so a sending process shoves the message out the door, and it relies on the infrastructure made available by the transport layer below it. And so it's the transport layer that implements services, and through the socket, the process running in the application layer uses these services of the transport layer, and the transport layer service guarantees the delivery of this packet information to the transport layer for the other endpoint on the other side of this communication. And so here you'll see in the diagram the, the socket API, this golden box, it straddles the seam between the application layer and the transport layer on the sender side, it's the sender side, and also on the receiver side, here's the receiver side. Okay, so how then do you identify the communicating processes at the endpoints of this communication on the sender side and receiver side? Now, in order to receive a message, you have to be uniquely identified. And so you need some identifier, an address, uh, that allows the sender to be able to mark something as being intended for you. And so to receive messages, the process has to have this identifier. And this identifier is typically a 32-bit address called an IP address, IP standing for Internet Protocol. Uh, so this refers to the network layer, and we'll talk about that also in great detail when the time comes during the semester. And so one of the questions then is how does the IP address, which identifies a host and more correctly the network card on some machine, how does the IP address know which process will be the exit, exit point or the originator for some packet of information? So how does this happen? Well, you can have more than one process running on the same machine. So suppose we have a host A on the left-hand side, and say we have another machine, host B. Now, of course, they're both running application layers, application layers, here's the application layer, and it's five-layer internet stat because they're end systems or hosts, but right below the application layer is the transport layer. So I'm going to write in the transport layer, and straddling the seam between application layer and transport layer is a socket. Here's a socket here, and here's another socket. Now, of course, you have more than one process. So you might have your instant messaging process, P1. You might have your email, call that process P2, etc. Uh, here's your instant messaging, P1. Here's your email, P2. So, of course, you have more than one process on the sender or receiver endpoint in this communication, host A or host B. So, how exactly, if you can identify this machine with an IP address, and you can identify this machine with an IP address, how do you know once that packet is delivered to this machine that it's going to get to the right process? So, you need some way to distinguish not only just the machine, and that's the role of a 32-bit IP address, you also need to identify the particular process once you've identified the machine. Because at the end of the day, each packet that's sent should be identified as which process it came from on that machine, as well as on the receiver endpoint, which packet or which process it should be delivered to on the receiver endpoint of the communication. And so the identifier includes both an address and a so-called port number. And a port number is a unique identifier that for a particular machine tells you either from which application this information, from which, app, from which application or process uh, this packet has originated, or to which process or application this packet should be delivered. And so the port number along with the IP address are used to identify the machine, that's the IP address, and then identify the process associated with that packet uh, on uh, once you get to that machine. So its, it's port number is to distinguish between the application associated uh, with the packet, which application is associated with it. And so there are well-known port numbers. The port number for HTTP server is port number 80. And if you actually enter in a port number, you'll say your www.domainname.com, and then you say colon, and then the port number. 
and port number 80 is reserved uh, for hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP. Uh, there are other port numbers that are set aside for certain purposes, such as the mail server, simple mail transfer protocol, SMTP, is port number 25. So then if you wanted to send an HTTP request uh, to gaia.cs.umass.edu, which is a companion uh, website, or at least it's the website for the Computer Networks Research Group at UMass Amherst, uh, where Jim Carosa is a full professor, and distinguished professor, rather. Uh, and you would give the IP address of Gaia, which is 128.1.1.9.245.12, as well as the port number, port number 80. And so with a browser, you can type in this IP address and port number. There's no need to use uh, cics.umass.edu or gaia.cs.umass.edu. The computer and your browser and the IP and the web server are perfectly happy to use the IP address and the port number. The string name, our domain name, is is only there for human benefit. People are much better at remembering descriptive names than they are remembering numbers for IP addresses and port numbers. And so the protocol at the application layer is going to define a number of things. It's going to define overall what the application is going to do uh, as it interacts with other parts of it scattered across the network, be they the client or the server. And so first thing that application layer, layer protocol is going to do is describe the types of messages you exchange, uh, what are requests from a client, and what are responses from a server, as well as from peers. It's also going to describe the format of the messages, the message syntax, what the fields are in the message, what they mean, and how they are delineated or separated from one another. Then it's also going to talk about the message semantics, what's the meaning of the different values that fields in your message can take on, and then a set of rules, uh, how the process should send and respond, how should each one of the involved processes behave when presented with a particular message type, a particular value also in each field. And so there are different types of protocols, so-called open protocols are standardized, and the specifications for these open protocols are specified in the request for comments uh, managed by the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. And this allows for interoperability. If you want your web browser to work with any web server, and if you want to implement a web server and have it uh, accessed by any web browser, as long as you adhere to the implementation spec uh, outlined in the RFC, it's going to interoperate. So this is the standardization. And so some popular ones include things like HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is the basis of the World Wide Web, as well as SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which is used for transferring email data to some machine out there. Uh, there are also proprietary protocols, things you'll never get to see unless you work at those companies, uh, things like Skype, uses a proprietary uh, mess, uh, protocol for transferring packets, and I'm pretty sure WebEx does the same as well. Now, one of the questions that you want to ask, if you never create network stacks, you want to understand the services made available to the application layer by the transport layer. And so that makes you a better creator of network applications, because if there's a mismatch, then your application is not going to perform well, and dare I say, you're going to have some catastrophic results. And so some applications, like file transfer, need 100% reliable data transfer. That means you can't have any bits that are corrupted, you can't have any bits that are missing. And so with the development of applications, network applications specifically, it's also very important that you understand what services are available by the underlying transport layer. And like we saw in the airlines travel example, uh, when we talked about layering for the previous chapter, chapter one, we saw that this layering can be treated as some layer above makes use of the services offered by the layers below. Okay. And so some applications need reliable transfer. Others, like audio, can tolerate some loss. And so when you're going to write a network application, it's important to sit down and really think and analyze about how you use data. If you have an application that needs reliable data transfer, don't use unreliable data. If you have an application that can tolerate loss, 
uh, it's sort of a slowdown and overkill to use a reliable data transfer mechanism. And so all of this is specified in the set of socket APIs and something that you indeed should look at when you're going to sit down and write a network application. And so some also need timing. Uh, things like telephone applications, like Magic Chat or so-called IP phones, uh, they require very low delay to be effective. So that means the amount of time it takes when you say something for it to reach the destination should be less than equal to or no more than a certain upper bound. That's really, really important for some types of applications. And then throughput. Some just need a lot of bandwidth, things like multimedia, um, TV on demand, multimedia on demand, streaming movies and TV, you just need a lot of bandwidth. You need to be able to get through that and generate those channels of communication and pass the packets along them um, at a high rate. And then other applications, so-called elastic apps, will make use of whatever throughput they get. All right. And certainly this last one should not be an afterthought. Security is very, very important. Um, methods including data integrity and encryption certainly can give you a very good and secure result. And so this table is in the book, and it talks about the relationship uh, between various factors, uh, like the application that you have in mind, uh, whether it can tolerate data loss. And so if we see that web documents and file transfer can't tolerate data loss, and if you think about that, let's unpack this thought for a few moments, is that you can't tolerate data loss because the file is now corrupted if you're missing some part of it, even if it's one bit. Same thing with email, that email no longer has meaning if, you miss a thing, if you're missing one bit even. And then the throughput um, can be elastic, meaning it can take up whatever bandwidth there, and others are much more modest on the throughput. Audio, for example, 5 kilobit per second to 1 megabit per second. And time sensitive, is there an upper bound or should the delay on these messages be bounded or is that a no-no? And so some applications such as web documents, uh, real-time audio, uh, has an upper bound on the delivery time. And so imagine if we were speaking and I said something and then maybe a few seconds later that arrived. And so what you would hear is I would say something, and then you're like waiting for me to finish what I'm saying when really I'm still talking, and all of a sudden it arrives later. It's out of context, and that communication doesn't make any sense. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's in the book. Um, I encourage you to, to take a look at it. And so these are the transport services made available for the two major flavors of transport protocols uh, in the five-layer internet stack for the transport layer. And these are made available to the application layer. Uh, this TCP service stands for Transmission Control Protocol, and the UDP service stands for Unreliable Datagram Protocol. And so looking at TCP, um, it's reliable. That means whatever you send is going to be received at the receiver endpoint, that process at the other edge device in the internet. And so that means multiple things. It means that things will be delivered in order. If you send bit 0, bit 1, bit 2, it arrives in that order, bit 0, bit 1, bit 2. Uh, it is not corrupted. It is, you know, 1010 uh, bit sequence is delivered as 1010, nothing more, nothing less. Um, flow control is another feature or service afforded by TCP. Flow control avoids the whole idea that the sender will overwhelm the receiver. And so in that, the receiver will learn later, sends back information and says, hey, this is how much space I have and this is how fast I can receive data. And then the server says, okay, well, uh, the sender side says, okay, let me slow down the amount of data that I'm sending. So this flow control is the ratcheting back the rate of sending in order to match the receiver's ability to store that sent data with the server, with the sender. And so congestion control is related, but not the same. Congestion control allows for the throttling or the ratcheting down of the send rate after detection of uh, too much information in the network. So if you're getting congestion and packet loss, uh, the sender, why send at a high rate if you're losing a lot of information? walk down the rate of sending uh, to match what the network is able to uh, accommodate. 
Um, but one thing that TCP does not provide is timing. It doesn't give you minimum throughput. It can remember it's statistical sharing that we talked about, uh, and that's one of the reasons. It can't guarantee you throughput unless you were able to reserve that channel of communication exclusively, which is not the case at the moment. It's connection-oriented. Uh, with TCP Reliable Service, it requires you to establish a connection between the client and server processes. And so that so-called call setup means that you're asking that endpoint do you have the resources in order to engage in these reliable protocols or these reliable behaviors, these reliable data delivery services? Now, UDP is unreliable data transfer between the sending and receiver process. It doesn't provide any guarantee. No reliability, no flow control, no congestion control, no timing, anything. And so the biggest thing of value that UDP provides, you might ask, well, why do I want something that's unreliable? Well, all of that reliability comes at a cost, and that's one of the things you'll find in computer networking. In this particular case, the cost of speed is unreliability. So if you want on something that's fast, do UDP, because that reliability requires you to do extra things, and doing all those extra things and all the bookkeeping ends up slowing down the rate at which you're sending. And so why bother? Well, because UDP is much, much faster. And especially for applications like multimedia streaming, if you can tolerate um, some glitches here and there, then UDP is the better choice because video requires you to have very fast send rates. Moreover, the idea of loss in video is mitigated uh, by buffering at the endpoint. So you start your video you don't play anything yet at the user, but after getting so many seconds worth of video sent over, that's when you start streaming the video and you don't do it directly um, from uh, the socket on the receiver side. You don't receive it directly from the socket on the receiver side. And so this is just a survey of various applications and the protocol that's used and whether or not it uses uh, reliable service TCP or unreliable service UDP. And so in order to secure it, well, plain vanilla TCP and UDP provides no encryption. So if your application sent a password into the socket, it would be in clear text. And anyone with something like Wireshark could come along, uh, start the packet sniffer, and actually capture your username and your password. And so what Secure Sockets does, or SSL, Secure Sockets Layer, it provides a socket that can do encryption. And so what does that look like? Okay, well, here are the upper two layers in your five-layer internet stack. You have the application layer, you have the transport layer, and then you have your socket. Now, with a regular socket, there's no encryption, but with a secure socket, it's a socket that also does encryption. So imagine that's a socket just like this one, but it has an encryption function. And so that means anything that is being sent to the socket for delivery to the other endpoint on the internet will be encrypted before it actually is sent out into the network. And so what that means in Wireshark, you notice uh, in that first project assignment, if you visited a secure website, and you know that it was a secure website, if you see HTTPS, and then you also see a lock icon go on right in front of your URL. Now, that lock icon means that that connection is secure, i.e. it's being encrypted. Now, in Wireshark, when you do that, you're going to see something like TLS version one or something like that. And that TLS stands for transport layer security. It means the socket is doing some encryption, which is why when you visit or if you visit secure websites and try to do packet sniffing on them, you don't see HTTP messages. You only see TLS messages. Okay. And so SSL provides encryption for TCP connections. It gives you data integrity as well as something called endpoint authentication. You can verify that the person you're talking to on the other end of your communication is who you think it is. And so SSL is at the application layer. Uh, TLS is at the transport layer. So let's take a look briefly at the web. We'll just introduce this. 
Now, let's look at a review. Now, a web page consists of a bunch of objects. It's so-called semi-structured, semi-structured document. Now, a web page, it has some text. It might have some pictures, might have a video, might have some more text, maybe a bulleted list, and maybe some fields to type stuff in. Now, you know, it's very complex. And you think of a web page, what it really is, is a file that specifies different components, and these components are called objects. And so a web page consists of a set of objects, and an object could be an HTML file, a JPEG image, a Java applet, audio file, video, what have you. And so the web page consists of a base HTML file, and inside this file are a set of objects that are referenced. And each object is specified by something called a URL, a uniform resource locator. And what that URL does, it specifies some resource that is distributed across the Internet. And if this thing is going to live on the Internet, you need some pieces of information. You need the host name for where that resource is located. Once you get to the host name, you need a directory, path name, which folder is it in, and then you have the name of the resource itself. So what this is saying is on a machine called someschool.edu, and it's given a domain name, that's what this is, and we'll talk about domain names, go to the directory called some department, and it's at the root level, and inside that directory, you'll call the, you see a file called pick.gif. So it's an image. And so if you look at the HTML for your web page, you might see a reference command like this, but when it gets displayed or drawn by your browser, it's actually going to draw that picture where that reference command was made. And so the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, is that protocol that's used describing the conversation and the interaction between your web client, which is your web browser, and your web server. And now, the most popular web server out there is an open source uh, web server by what's called the Apache Foundation. And if you wanted to stand up your own website, it's uh, web, uh, nothing fancy about it, you could do it in your home, uh, you just download the Apache web server, uh, you follow the instructions, you uh, get it running, you advertise your machine, associate it with a domain name, and there's your hosted website. Now, a lot of people buy hosting accounts. It's a lot easier. They handle things like backups and power and stuff like that. And you can get a web hosting account for about $100 a year. They're not terribly expensive anymore. Uh, and this HTTP tr uh, protocol, this hypertext transfer protocol, is the application layer protocol that drives the web. And so it is a client-server model, and so you have two entities or two processes involved. One's called the client, and that's the web client or the HTTP client, as you might uh, see it described in the literature. That's your web browser. Now, your web browser, it's the one that initiates the request uh, to a web server to fetch or give it the HTML file, hypertext markup language file, that contains references to objects. And once this HTML file is fetched, it's sent back to the, the client and a, as a response, and then the client gets it, interprets it, and draws what you see as your web page. Now, the hypertext transfer server, that's your web server. And it sits out there, it has a static IP address, and it sits out there waiting for requests get me this file, get me that file. It receives the request, chops it up, and returns back the response. So here in this example, and this is in the book, uh, we have a PC uh, running maybe the Firefox browser. That's a web client. It issues an HTTP request to a web server running Apache, and it gets back a response. Uh, likewise, you have a mobile device. It issues an HTTP request, and you get back a response. Uh, and so you can have different types of HTTP clients, one running on your PC, one running on, for example, your iPhone or other mobile device. But nonetheless, 
they issue HTTP requests, the server gets it, it chops it up, processes it, performs the action, the fetch of that HTML file, it retrieves that HTML file or object, sends it back as a response across the wire, and then the browser gets it and draws it on its screen, depending on the commands listed in that HTML document. Now, of course, all of this happens instantaneously, and the beauty of HTTP is that you can deploy entire applications, and if you need to change the application, all you change is the description of the web page on the server. You don't have to go out and install new software on all the devices. And you, moreover, the same web page can adjust what it sends out to the device based on other types of information that might come along with the request. And we'll talk about those uh, attributes that might come along. But nonetheless, you can have the same web server serving the full content uh, on the PC if that's a PC client that requests. Or it can display the so-called clipped uh, content or the content specifically tuned uh, for smaller screens. Uh, moreover, there's other information that can come alongside these requests to fetch the French version of the website, for example, versus the English uh, version of the website. So this is what HTTP is, and when you type in your browser something like desu.edu, well, your browser is doing a lot of convenient stuff for you. It's inserting the HTTP, assuming the hypertext transfer protocol, and then it's also inserting the port number, which is port number 80 uh, for the HTTP server process. The HTTP client process can have any port number, but the server uh, port is always port number 80. That's what's been standardized and set aside for HTTP servers or web servers. Okay, so HTTP, the client initiates the TCP connection. It creates one of these sockets that it uses uh, at the application layer to send packets into the transport layer, tagging it with port number 80. And so that port number 80 tells the server when it receives that request from the client, it tells the server, hey, this is the process to which this packet should be delivered when it arrives at the destination endpoint, i.e. the web server. So the server accepts the TCP connection from the client, and then the HTTP messages, that's the application layer protocol, it's exchanged between the web client, your browser, and the web server. And then after the server sends the response to that request, after doing some work, the TCP connection or the secure, this uh, reliable connection is closed. Now, HTTP is a so-called stateless protocol. And stateless protocols, Sun Microsystems made a fortune over stateless protocols. A stateless protocol is one that does not maintain any information about past requests from the client. Now, in order to have stateful protocols, it requires a lot more resources. And so stateless protocols scale much more than the stateful protocols. And so applications that maintain state are much more complex because you have to remember this notion of a cursor or where someone left off or the previous history. And so HTTP is stateless, and that's why you can have these very highly scalable HTTP web-based applications. And so there are two types of HTTP connections. One is called non-persistent HTTP, and the other is called persistent HTTP. Now, before I talked about this fact that a web page has a series of objects. You might have an image here. You might have a hyperlink. You might have a video here. You might have some sort of interface here with buttons and, and, and fields and stuff like that. Now, of course, these objects are often resources that are identified using URLs, and they have to be fetched uh, either from the web server where you got the web page description or from other uh, servers on the internet. Now, with a non-persistent HTTP uh, connection, what that does is says every single object take, is, involves a unique connection. So you have, for example, for the web page description, you have one request to the server and then one response. And that's the description that says, okay, I have a page with this text and I have image number one, image number two, and perhaps some other video image resource or object number three. So now what it does, it gets this web page and it sees, oh, I have these three objects within this web page. So now I have to fetch image number one. So it issues a request, gets back image number one, 
it gets it initiates another request, gets back image or resource or object number two, and then it initiates another request to fetch object number three. Uh, that's a so-called non-persistent HTTP connection. And that non-persistent means that the HTTP connection between the client and the server does not stick around. Now, conversely, a persistent HTTP connection keeps the same connection open and reuses that connection to load all the other objects should you have multiple objects. So let's display that client again. And you have some web page that has the first object, second object, and the third object. And here's my server, my web server. And you have the first message, gives you back the web page. And this connection stays open. So first you say, get the web page web page. It returns back the web page. So then, using the same connection, it stays persistent. It sticks around, stays around. It's not torn down. You say, okay, now give me the first object. Request goes out, returns back first object. Now you use the same connection, give me the second. Request goes out, second object comes back as a response. And then likewise with the third object, request goes out, comes back with a response. There's the third object that was obtained from the server. And so with persistent HTTP, the same physical connection is reused to fetch subsequent objects. Whereas with non-persistent HTTP, it's a unique HTTP connection, request and response uh, for each of the objects. That's the web page in addition to all the other objects uh, that comprise that web page. All right. So this is an example of the interaction, and this is in the book. So let's say you enter in the following URL in your browser window. You type in www.sumschool.edu. Uh, it located in some department, uh, the home.index.html file. And so index.html uh, is the standard for HTTP uh, for the first web page that you see, your entry point into a website. And so let's assume that it contains some text, and it also refers to 10 JPEG images. So you have 10 pictures plus text. And so you start out, you initiate the client, the web browser, a connection to the HTTP server process that's running at some school at edu, and it's associated, this process, with port number 80. And so this message goes out from the client across the web, arrives at the machine associated with the name some school edu. Now, because it's a server process, it's waiting in the background, and it says, oh, I, anything destined for port 80, that's going to be delivered to me. So it sees that connection and accepts it, and then it notifies the client and says, yep, I hear you. I'm ready for action, ready for your incoming message. Uh, your wish is my command. And so the HTTP client, after that, it knows the server is ready, so it sends the request. Okay, get me this file uh, from your file system, this home.index file, this HTML file. So the client sends that request, and it has the URL describing that folder, some department, and that resource, home.index. So it sends it to the HTTP server. The server gets it, chops it up, and it says, aha, you want me to fetch this? Okay. So I'll go to my file system. I'll retrieve it into memory and send it back across the wire uh, to the web client. So the web client gets this HTTP, uh, this HTML file, and it chops it up, and it says, oh, wait a minute. This has 10 images that I need to display. So what does it do? The HTTP server, after it closes the connection, the client receives the response. It chops it up, and it says, oh, I have 10 objects. Here are the references for the 10 objects in this HTML file. So I'm going to initiate 10 requests, each one of these steps, 1 through 5, 10 times each time to fetch each of those 10 JPEG images, and then it closes the connection, and then it draws the web page, and you see that response in literally fractions of a second. Okay. And so that's the whole interaction for HTTP. We will continue with our discussion of HTTP and the web uh, in our next module. And so with that, just remind you, please make sure you look at the Blackboard and look at homework number one, numero uno. It is due a week from today on the 4th of February, one second before midnight at the usual 11.59 and 59 seconds via Blackboard. So with that, uh, as usual, please stay healthy, stay safe during this time of COVID, and I'll see you all on 
Tuesday.